Hello and welcome to Castle of Horror, the show dedicated to horror movies and awesomeness. This week we have a look at the horror film Late Night with the Devil. This is episode 433. Bear in mind, if you haven't seen today's movie, we're going to be talking about it from the perspective of horror fans who have seen it. So warning, spoilers ahead from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, publisher at Castle Bridge Media, home of the Castle of Horror Anthology. With me from Austin is Tony Salvaggio, lead singer and bassist of the band Deserts of Mars and lead guitarist of the band Rise from Fire. Say hello, Tony. Howdy. Howdy. Also in Austin, Mr. Drew Edwards is the writer-creator of the long-running underground comic Halloween Man, which you can find at Global Comics. He is a Best Writer Ringo nominee, Austin Chronicle Best of Austin Award winner, and a member of the Penn America Fellowship. Say hello, Drew. Praise Abraxas. <laughs> which to me is, you know, the finest, the finest album by Santana. And finally, also in Denver, color commentary from Julia Guzman of Guzman Immigration of Denver. Say hello. The power of Christ compels you again. Wonderful. Uh, <laughs> all right. Late Night with the Devil. This is listed as a 2023 horror film, but actually, I think in most theaters, we saw it in 2024. It was written, directed, and edited by Colin and Cameron Cairns. It stars David Dasmalkian, Laura Gordon, Ian Bliss, Faisal Bazi, Ingrid Torelli, Reese Ottery, Georgina Haig, and Josh Kwong Tart. That's a lot of Australians. Incorporating elements of documentary filmmaking and found footage, the film follows the events of a late night talk show episode aired on Halloween night in 1977. In 1977, how Halloween night, I was there, not not there, not in this room, but I, I remember it was a good Halloween, during which the host attempts to boost ratings by inviting an allegedly possessed girl onto the show. So, all right. Um, Clearly film, nothing will go wrong there. Right, right, right. Oh, my gosh. And by the way, it's Michael Ironside, uncredited, I think, who does the voice of the, uh, the, the narrator of the you know the, ostensibly there's a documentary that's surrounding this we we begin with documentary stuff and that's michael ironside's voice which is cool films on shutter no so all right um let's get our opening thoughts and then we'll get into topics some of which are hot 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 uh let's go julia tony drew uh and then i'll go um julia so opening thoughts late night with the devil um, I really enjoyed it. We saw it once in the theater and then again on Shudder. And um, I just thought it was just such a, an amazing looking f work. You know, it's like they have the, the documentary style at the beginning and then the talk show, 70s talk show style, the colors, the sort of the quality, even though it's, you know, still really qu a good f quality like it's not it's not fuzzy or, or or whatever but it still kind of feels like you're in the 70s for some reason yes. even the film and um you know i thought it just it looked really neat the performances were really interesting especially mm -hmm. to me um the girl that's that they bring on as the uh you know the possessed or not possessed but she's um she channels yes. i guess i guess she's sometimes possessed she's possessed yeah um <laughs> Uh, Ingrid Torelli is the actor's name. She's so interesting. She was freaking me out. I kept yelling at the screen, stop looking at my soul. <laughs> just like, quit it. He's just staring in the camera. Anyway, um, so really interesting. I thought David Desmogin was really interesting as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, thought, I liked it a lot. That's wonderful. Tony, uh, what are your thoughts? Did you catch this at Fantastic Fest, by the way? Uh, it was it was a South by. South by, right. Yeah, I did not get to catch it. Um, unfortunately, I you know I wish I, I didn't even get to catch it in the theater because I just had so much stuff going on. Um, also, uh, you know we'll talk about it later. There's a there's a lot of not so great things happen in production, or at least one thing, and so I was really torn about decisions that the uh, you know director made and stuff. So, uh, but as far as the the work itself, uh, great cast. Uh, it looks great. It looks uh, fairly authentic, um, and it's interesting. the The sum of its parts is very interesting. Like mm -hmm. you could you could take this so many different ways to turn it into a horror thing, and and you know pull in all those influences. Um, like we'll talk about it, like Ghost Watch and several other you know things. To is is fascinating, um, and just kind of where it goes, I think is is great. It's you know it's lean and mean up until kind of the end um yeah i i really like the look and feel i really like the cast um it's a shame that decisions were made that marred its release because it didn't have to be that way mm -hmm. uh you know we i'd much rather talk about all the awesome good stuff in it but 
yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it, overall, it's it's really pretty pretty cool. I'm glad we're talking about it. And we're going to hit on that stuff right off the bat. Sure, sure, sure. Fact, because I think I think it'll be it'll be good to uh, to to address the biggest controversies around this movie. Uh, I mean, we're not. Yeah, right. Yes, uh, Drew. Um, what are your opening thoughts? On, oh, um, oh, what a world we live in when a, a satanic movie comes out and that the, the devil aspects are not the controversial right. part of it. <laughs> that's, like, that's so true. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the, maybe the devil is the controversy. That is, yeah. that, that there is, there is something. I mean, the devil is in the details, so I guess yeah. it could be in there the, you the go. devil is in the machine, um, which actually is appropriate for this movie yeah. in a certain way. Um, I, I think it's really an interesting, you know, found footage movies are really tough to pull off. And I, you know, yeah. this is definitely one of the, the better, better ones. Um, yes. I, I really like you know most of the performances here i i like the the you know i guess staging idea of of putting it on a old talk show i think that was a very novel concept and i think it's one that they mostly pull off like it does have that feeling that you're watching an old clip from from johnny carson or something yes. like that um the the I agree with Julia that the performance of, of the actress playing the possessed girl is just phenomenal. She's she's so yeah, creepy with like her her line readings and facial expressions and everything. And um, you know, it's nice to see David Dismalkian in a, in a lead role. You know, usually he's he's kind of regulated to to character parts. And actually, I think the last time we talked about him was uh, Last Voyage of the Demeter. That's right. And yeah, he's he's kind of regulated to a character actor role. Here he's the star. Yes. And he he you know in a way it's like the least flashy performance i've seen from him but it's also the most nuanced because he is an incredibly sympathetic character at times while also being kind of slimy and corrupt as well and that's that's hard to pull off like that's that's a lot for an actor of the shoulder and he really does well so um, I I really enjoy the movie. I I'm not a hundred percent on like it, it, the the climax of the movie is as such that I if, if we were doing the star rating system, I would take it from being a five star movie down to being a four star because I'm I'm not a hundred percent on the climax, but I think mm -hmm. everything almost everything leading up to it is is top notch so um yeah, I, I i would go so far as to say, i think you're not even talking about the climax i think you're talking about the the denouement i guess you know because i think when the when the deep spoilers by the way once again spoilers <laughs> but when the demon makes itself known and starts it's crazy it's crazy uh, uh i don't even know um it's temper tantrum in the studio <laughs> i think that's the climax of the film uh but there's still 20 minutes or 10 or so minutes to go at that point. And the, um, the prolonged surrealist parts of this movie, I don't know that they quite match right. up with everything that, that is. Okay. That's fair. Right. Well, um, so let's get into it. Uh, the first, because we're going to come back around to that. So the first thing though, that I think we need to get out of the way is there, you know, when powder came out in 1995, there was a lot of uh, controversy over the fact that, for instance, in that case, the the people, the creative force behind the film was somebody that that morally um, everybody just just despised. Yeah, it was grotesque. Yeah, that was that was grotesque. Right. This has also a big controversy to it. And but it's a different one from the kind of the kind of. Uh, controversy that was around powder what is what is going on drew and w what are we to to think well there are some images in this film uh that they use for the you know because of the framing device as a television show of course they have parts where they're supposedly going to commercial and they have these images that crop up uh that are halloween themed because it's a halloween episode and um the images 
images were generated by um, AI, which yeah. um, has gone on. I, I don't know where the discussion was surrounding it um, when when the filmmakers were actually putting the movie together, but. Um, at the point that this movie came out, it was right after we had just had a big, you know, strike in Hollywood and AI being one of the big issues surrounding it. There is still a lot of discussion about how, you know, this so-called artificial intelligence is really just sort of a, a, plagiari a plagiarism machine to a degree. Yeah, And I, I do think that there is something to be said there. I, I, I think morally, um, perhaps the filmmakers were not fully informed. I know when AI programs first came out, I, I was not. And, um, you know, I messed around a little bit with it until I learned more about it, uh, particularly from as a comic book creator. You know, I, I know a lot of artists. And I right. was able to, to, you know, get get the sort of straight dope about how it's hurting a lot of commercial artists' livelihood. So yeah. I, I don't think that the arguments against them using it in the film are entirely baseless. I also think aesthetically, you know, the, this movie has a near flawless 1970s aesthetic. Yeah, And then when these images, for me, I don't know about how everybody else felt about it, but for me, when these images cropped up on my screen, they did take me out of the movie because especially now that like, when I, I really know what to look for when I'm, when I, when I, you know, yeah. I'm looking at images and I'm like, is this an AI image? And these are very obviously AI images generated in the 21st century so when i was watching the movie and these images would come up they really did take me out of the the near perfect um 1970s facsimile that that the movie is otherwise in so you can you can also very strongly make the argument that the, the that by cutting corners the filmmaker shot themselves in the foot um, so there's, there's i'm sure more... they would agree with you about that now i mean yeah. I, absolutely well yeah. except painful part is instead of going look we just really like that was just wrong like we didn't know it was going to be wrong like we'd see it we're now it's a post strike like that was bad uh they just kind of sloppily went ah, what can you? like it was a really non-apology apology and sometimes you know uh marketing wise or whatever uh you know i've even had times where people have instructed like the more you admit guilt the worse it is mm. and that can happen but it's it's painful too because i mean as an artist uh as an animator as a, you know knowing all my you know people there, there are ways to use that as a tool and in fact i also you know i had friends like oh man you could do a, like a non-for-profit rpg and you could make your characters you could do some of your art with it and stuff like mm -hmm. that and i i looked into it uh and i i did like a photo collage for one thing that of course i never used because i I was like, well, I wonder if we could get this style and then realize exactly what it was doing and how many, un like how nobody had consented for any of this, right? Yeah. And then also now there's like, uh, you know, AI music, AI video, it, all kinds of stuff. And it's not, I, I don't want to go too far into it, but the problem with the, the slippery slope problem is it's not like AI is going to, or uh, generated, AI generated images uh, are going to replace all artists, but the uh, it only has to convince uh, cheap like it only has to convince upper management like yeah. well, we could get by with X amount of AI art right like and that's been happening at, at a lot of big corporations where they're firing people and then going well, well I think that's we why only need art we only need art that's good enough yeah. so instead of hiring uh, you know concept artists or you know even lower level artists whose whose job is to do i say lower level i mean you know people who are going to work or are just getting their well, start in this I, case I don't wanna, tony yeah. hiring somebody like if i had gone to if i were doing this and and i had gone to an, uh, an illustrator and said can you go and create something that looks kind of like an old ubiworks still frame and 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 right. put a we'll be right back on it you know so it looks like an interstitial that yeah. would be a, something that somebody could spend an afternoon doing. Exactly. And, and we get paid to do it. 
you know, no, and that's and, that's the big thing. And also, you know, the other part is it that that courted controversy. And then, you know, I think we probably can move on. Uh, hopefully, sure. hopefully, and hopefully, it doesn't mar the rest of it. Uh, which is also, you know, we I was torn on whether or not I was going to watch this. So, but it's right. that early on, I was oh, it's just the interstitials. But there's key art throughout the set well, that was also oh, is that proven something? to be that. And that that's you just kind of want to go. <sighs> Like you want, you, you want to yeah. just, just admit it. And just, can we, can we talk about like, can we talk about it? And then well, like, cause I'd also, it sucks because all the people we've listed, like the cast is amazing. The look is great. Everything. And for that to be, for that to be the devil that ruins it. Yeah. Is disconcerting. <laughs> and if, if I, may, oh, it's Tony, frustrating. If yeah. I yeah. May, though, Tony, I still think it's good that we are talking about this movie. Aside from the fact that it has many, aspects that were created by humans that are excellent the failing on a human's part to you know grapple with this this new technology and and the the lack of morality in it now allows us you know first of all as a group on this podcast to talk about it and bring a shine a light onto something that is no doubt going to be uh, an ongoing issue for all of the all of us who make our our living as oh, creatives, yeah. but also um, I think you know it, it allows something to the broader dialogue uh, yeah. about it. And you know what I'm hoping because I do think that this is you know a filmmaker with promise. What I'm hoping instead of like doubling down and being stubborn is that privately they have learned a lesson and you know we'll we'll you know go forward and and reward human excellence and human achievement instead of relying on a a program because yeah. you know certainly you know i i am aside from any moral or or you know ethical concerns about AI, I'm just not impressed by it because I am yeah. impressed by by human excellence in art. You know, a machine does not impress me. I, I just yeah. want to point out that uh, running a, a, a publishing company, as I do with uh, with my partner, Insure, we are, we are manifestly not, well, like we do covers, we will not do an AI cover. And there's two reasons for it. One, I believe that it is, I, I, I believe it's stealing jobs because it clearly is. Uh, I believe it's stealing work. That's the one that is really worrisome because you can't always tell, but it's, you know, it's stealing work. Mm -hmm. But also I feel like I owe that to all these artists that I work with because they would feel betrayed if I exactly. started using. And so, so for me, I'm not going to do it. But what these guys were thinking, I got no idea. You know, it was, well, I, I still, you know, and again, perhaps this is Pollyanna-ish of me. I still wonder because they made this movie before for the strike yes is, that's right. if there was some ignorance involved yeah it's like possible. It, i don't know it, yeah. you know what we and we'll never know but you know there's there is still quite a bit in this movie to talk about other than than and it's images in closing though i also anybody who does go that's a slippery slope. I, you know, I won't know part of that. I agree. I hope that you don't lump us. I hope that we've made the case of like, why? I mean, we are also torn as artists. Like, man, you know, is this the one? Well, we, like, had a, I, we had a whole, right. we had a whole discussion on our, on our yeah. group chat. But so, I don't, yeah. I don't blame anybody who's like, I can't, I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to watch that. I can't, like, I, I do not blame that. And I, I struggle. We decide, you know, but I do think that, that the people, the actual people, uh deserve like a lot of credit because there's a again like a fantastic cast we can move on but i yeah. i think there's a lot to discuss that's really great about this that you know the decisions of a few marred it in a, yeah. in a major way all right so let's talk first about what the movie is uh setting aside these 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 interstitials the film is 1970 what do we say it was 77 76 um yeah. you know 77 and, yeah, Halloween 77. There couldn't be a more 70s year than 77, obviously. And, you know, that's well, the year. It's 77 because it was the year that Halloween fell on a Monday so that it would work with the whole oh, that thing makes of, sense. of him wanting to be, you know, wanting to uh, kick off Sweeps Week 
with that makes sense. <laughs> wow, good thought. Yeah, that's well, great. If you remember, if you go back a couple of years on this show, we did the uh, Paul Lind Halloween special. And that gives you a solid idea because that was like around this same time. And that gives you a solid idea of what a variety show. Now, it wasn't a late night talk show like this one is, but it's still it was a Halloween variety show of the era. And it gives you an idea of what a strange thing like variety television was in the 70s, where it sort of appeals to like all ages, but no ages. There's like winking right. jokes for adults, but there's also like just extremely juvenile like lightweight everybody gets it humor and it well that's boy, how talk shows are still though like they're, they're really still the same i mean you watch the tonight show and there's really really dumb things which you do i mean you're a big fan of the tonight show just to be i love i love all the i i love all the strike force five shows yes i'm just i'm just <laughs> picturing all the white dudes yeah i'm just picturing kind of that crossover between that fall in I've met Mr. Riggles before at a bar. <laughs> ah, I'm so glad that you brought that impression back. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, for me, because, you know, I was I was not even born in 1977. I wasn't born until a year later. But um, okay. there was some familiarity here because I do feel like that there is some, like, crossover into the 80s, especially 80s Carson when he would have, like, Vincent Price or Elvira or something on mm -hmm. for, for Halloween. Like, this. Yes. And also, once again, a this is a perfect October movie that, for some reason, was released in the middle of the summer. Like, yeah. Why, why do you, Hollywood, why do you keep doing that? I, I can't explain that right? at all. What no a great date, date movie this would be. Also, for, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I, no, uh, no, you didn't. Um, you know, it's also when you talk about Carson, too, uh, the, the number of times he had James Randi on, the amazing yes. Randi, who's, you know, there's an analog, I mean, a direct <laughs> analog yes. to the amazing Randi in this show. Like, like yeah. calling that back, that's kind of that's part of the this genius is kind of how of a, this is structured i think of it as as an easter egg movie where where yeah. everything you're looking at from the design of the set to each of these characters each of these characters is kind of an easter egg to something and even the plot points like real. the you know some of the things that happen yeah well yeah i mean for instance the way that the demon appears when lily first brings out the demon of braxis is is a straight homage to the exorcist which is funny because we think about the exorcist so much and yet it's rare that somebody actually goes ahead and does a full on the exorcist you know with yeah, I mean there's like I said the like he, he you know the um Carmichael says the power of Christ compels you yes and um and um what's her name J uh, June is that her name June the doctor uses, yeah the doctor yeah, she uses a uh, get behind me satan but in latin i think it is uh, yes. anyway but that's that's a different uh, but still but yes. you know all those allusions to uh, to those so, wonderful horrors. so like who are these let's talk about who these people are supposed to be first of all in the opening documentary they have that the the FBI did a um uh, a siege on this this uh compound where all of these Satan uh, demon worshipers were and it ends up catching fire. Now that, uh, even though, you know, like as Julia, as you pointed out, there was the Jim Jones tragedy, but this it's is a lot more like what happened the with Davidians. the yeah. Branch Davidians. Yes. In Waco. And that was actually like, like 15 or so years after that, but it doesn't matter because you know, if, as you were pointing out to pe some people who are commenting online and first discovering this stuff, it's all this munged, just, flowy past anything before you're born this all sort of flows together so well, it's like a, 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 a late 20th century potpourri right <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah um so yes uh uh there was a branch davidian style conflagration and out of it was pulled this girl lily who came into the the uh control of a psychiatrist or whatever she is a, a therapist of sorts called June Ross Mitchell. And their experience is patterned after Tony. I think you turned me on to this documentary. It was called Satan Wants You. And it was all about the birth of the satanic panic because of a relationship just like these two people who are who are guests on this on this show. Um, you know, in that case, by the way, it was a guy. It was a male doctor. Um, but he had he had taken under his wing. That's a great yeah. Yeah. 
that's a great documentary by the way and just chilling and terrifying and made me super angry again i think we've talked a lot about satanic panic stuff in the past but that yeah that's a good documentary also also a chilling documentary on how misinformation and hysteria can rise again in our day and age so yeah if you haven't seen it you it is worth worth seeing you know that was that was coming out at about the same time as uh there was there was a thing called it wasn't cult film there was a documentary that uh i thought was on shutter but it was about movie myths and they had they did an episode on oh cursed films and they did one on the exorcist right and and they were talking about how people's ideas of what demonic possession looked like changed forever after the exorcist you know it it really sunk like into people's bones that that that's what demonic possession looks like and that's how people behave and and you know the regurgitating and the and the cracked skin and all all of that stuff and speaking in tongues everything and it 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 was amazing like how like this is super influenced by the exorcist but it's influenced in the way that the culture at the time absolutely would be go ahead Drew. I think well, almost, almost to me when you you see the, the you, you know the initial appearance of the demon which is very exorcist you know influence and then you see the way the demon actually looks yes at the very very end of towards the end of the film i think it almost feels like the demon kind of toying with your expectations oh that's interesting because, i have because thought what about we, that. Well, what we end up with is right. actually a lot more horrific and looks more like something out of the thing. Like it's it's really right, but with like those this with this, the split head and the spread out eyes like that, it does look like the sting, but it also looks a lot like the red dragon. Um, this yeah. is the, I, I'm saying this out loud, and this is the first time I've had this thought, so I, I may remember, uh, I may misremember that painting, but I remember the red dragon painting having spread out eyes like that. So I think it might be influenced by that, but really, I don't know. We don't have them on the show, so we can't. But it's the, my point is, is that it's it's it is much more body horror, you know. Yes. <laughs> much more of a grotesque distortion of the human form like the the makeup in the exorcist while shocking it 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 looks like a human being that that could have injured themselves like it's it's yes. within the bounds yeah that's an excellent of, point yeah yeah it's it's reality based whereas you know like the end of the the, the final form of the demon in this is is yes. extremely grotesque and uh and i mean that in the in the the most positive way possible because oh, yeah. I, I i it's an impressive it's a hell um, of a design so uh, i have a question based on what you're saying and I, I don't mean to skip to the end but i wonder if given what you're what we're talking about the, the fact that the demon that when um when Lily is channeling the demon or whatever, uh, it's her skin cracks, but then as soon as she's not, the demon leaves, her skin is back to normal. I wonder if the demon can fix her at the end. Like, you know how, because at the end she's, it's spoilers, she's dead. But I wonder if she's actually dead or if the demon can just bring her right back again. Like it's it's all kind of and any of them really. Well, we're gonna we're works. gonna have to get to the end because yeah yeah. But I'm just thinking like I have a lot of questions about the reality of the end. Exactly so. yeah yeah yeah. Anyway, that's just a put that thought that pops in my head. I was going to forget it if we didn't. If I didn't no, no, I'm, I'm glad you did. So uh, also here, of course, um, David Dasmalkian himself. And as you guys pointed out, you know, he played he played the uh, the sort of lieutenant in um, uh, in the Dracula movie, the Demeter. Uh, and he was really wonderful there. But here I just saw a totally new David Dasmalkian. He he was, you know, he he, he gets a chance because he's the star. He gets a chance to exhibit like a full range of emotions and you kind of really get to know this guy well, and i was well, just well, impressed. also like he's handsome in this movie right like, he, yes he's he's very you know not only you know he's got a nice suit on and everything but you know like his hair like i just a few months ago watched a movie where he's like the, he, he plays a suspect that is suspected of being the boston strangler and he looks like a, a like just a scuzzball so yes. like it, he you has know, a tendency it, it, to look pasty and greasy and you know and, and that's just what they do to him well and, he and, takes a lot of the same kind of roles that i think peter laurie took back yeah. in the day 
like like which are they're not only character parts but they're 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 degenerates yeah usually yeah so he's wonderful here you know and and i like it's interesting that they don't choose to make him johnny carson you know the most famous or or an analog to johnny carson the guy who's in charge and and the best uh they well, no, he said he's, him... ru- he's he's always wanting to catch up right. to johnny carson but he's actually um what's this ca- the guy's name don, uh, don um oh gosh what is it don lane it's he's based on the don lane show apparently oh interesting okay. yeah see i don't know that show at all but i did it's australian you know. it's an australian talk show which uh, makes sense given that everybody's australian oh uh, that makes sense <laughs> uh so you know so he's he's really pretty good and he gets to go through his paces uh chris do well that the Oh, go ahead. I, 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 the, the fact that, that this is a guy that's grieving his wife on top mm-hmm. of everything else, I think is like the most impressive thing about this performance because like he does a really good job of, of oscillating between, you know, that and then, you know, a fame, fame hungry asshole. Yeah. Well, and the grief of the wife is complicated by the fame hungry asshole because he's, it's his fault that she's dead because of his grief. Yes. So he's Although got, he doesn't grief. quite realize that. No, he does, him. though. He does. I'm, he, he I'm does. actually torn too with whether he completely understands I, I think that he he's knows. the one who's, who's a, a, that he actually, I think he did knew that, that when, I think he knew that when he made that deal with the devil that that was. And then she got sick. That that was probably the 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 you know the sacrifice because he he knew he was going to have to make a sacrifice. It's it's ambiguous though. They don't quite spell it out. So because he like, sure doesn't seem he, I it could be that he's such a vainglorious person that he's capable of lying even to himself. You know, so that because he really he really doesn't seem to be that. If uh, he doesn't. I, I, he doesn't seem to have guilt that he has basically, what are we trying to say? That he allowed, that he let the demons give his wife cancer so he would be famous. Like that's, that, that doesn't, he doesn't come across like that kind of guy. Like well, guy, I don't think he, I don't think he quite believes in right. demons until the events of this, like You're whether right. or not he, he, you know, obviously he had taken a part in, in, in some, some occult type rituals, but you know, yeah. I think I think he did that more for the the hobnobbing with the rich and yep. powerful aspects of it. Like he, because I think if he believed the devil was for real, why in the hell would he put himself in this position? Right. Yeah, like, and I think do it all the time. I think part yeah. of Jason, what you're seeing is also, and this is you know this is a test to how good he is as an actor and how he plays this character. Um, I think he also he feels like he's been through all of this and thus that was the sacrifice that was the mm. you know like I've been I've been through so so now I'm on and I have to be fa- like I have to do this now like mm. it almost all ended for him so like yeah. for him maybe yet or, or maybe he has been through that right like you know this this is my chance because he still feels like it's not like you know you're saying he's he's not as worried or whatever but he still feel he still feels this like yeah need to go no i have to do all of these things this night to get these ratings yeah. and everybody's telling like dude we just just go out like just go out on a high note you know yeah like you don't have to why don't why do you call us losing, quits? Like, you don't have to try so hard yeah exactly yeah, yeah. and so in it, part of what's interesting about the character is that he's seen it as like his last hope and maybe and those were the lows and if if he doesn't come out on top then Everything he's lost is is completely lost. It was all for naught, right? You can't accept that. But also, it's his ego that's that's getting in the way. But we don't. We all we start to see that as it goes along. When we're introduced to him, we're like, oh man, he's had a rough time. Like this yeah. is a man on the brink, you know. And and that's how that's how it grabs you. Is you know you want him to be successful. You want this to like be an accident. <laughs> It's fate. funny how everybody is actual is um, sympathetic in that way. For instance, June Ross Mitchell, the, the the parapsychologist who works with Lily, her the the real life version of her is a schmuck. Like he was using that young lady 
for sexual favors and for everything. But this woman really seems to believe in what she's, if, if we're to understand the way she's presented and we're, and if we're to understand that she's basically telling the truth when she talks, you know, she's, she seems to, she's, she seems to be on it. Oh, she's also dating David Desmalky in the character. Yeah. That's the, that's well, they're, big they are, they're at least sleeping together. Right. Yes. You know, his wife has been dead for a couple of years. It's not something for us to be horrified by that he has a that he has a girlfriend but it's a secret but she seems basically to be well you know we get but that's the that's what they do a pretty good job with i found parts as we move along and we see the interaction and um you know every everybody's questioning her you yeah. do see start to see a little bit of like hmm, maybe the exploitation is actually there mm. uh but that's Again, that's part of the the nuance of things. Is yeah. there is there is an undercurrent of she could be doing this for all the role. Like, why is she bringing well, her on a talk show? Every, right? Like, every, that's bad. That's not great. If you're trying to keep somebody out of the limelight and you're trying to help them, maybe a talk show isn't the best way to do true. that. Like, well, but she like, but she exploitative. would say that she let her boyfriend talk her into it. Uh, of course, but but that's everybody, still exploitative. Yeah. You know, everybody yeah. in here has this sort of duality to them yeah absolutely you have, you have the psychic who you know is initially presented as a fake psychic but as it turns yes. out maybe not so fake and then you have the guy that's debunking you know supernatural fraud yes you know which seems like that should be at least a a laudable thing to do but he's also an arrogant prick. So, yes, yes, he is. You know, um, <laughs> although, to me, the most consistently entertaining character in this whole movie. Oh, he's he, really he great. He, he is. I want to mention Chris do the psychic. Two things that he's like what, in the Easter egginess of the. To some extent, this movie is kind of a stunt. Like you're watching it, and you're really. I, I feel like you're supposed to be going, "Oh, that's like this, and that's like this." So, so I think if that's annoying, if if there's a possibility that you could watch it and go, I don't really feel like playing that game. I just want a, a, a story. Then this movie is probably going to over deliver for you, you know, but, but I really loved the Easter egging thing about that. Chris do sounds like Criswell, the, 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 the guy sitting in the coffin in Ed Wood's movies, but he, uh, he, ha he exhibits the psychic powers of Whoopi Goldberg in ghost where she's, she's a, a kind of a sham, but she actually also has, has psychic medium abilities. Um, you know the Orson guy... Welles had that experience. Who, where that? He was... Did you know that Orson Welles had that experience? No. He, um, he used to do magic on stage. And mm. for a little while he did psychic. He was doing the psychic thing. Uh -huh. And he got to a point where he did a reading and it was like too on the nose, too huh. accurate. And then he was like, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> That's so interesting. He got too freaked out by it. I thought it was pretty funny. That is that is wonderful. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. What else is it? So I, I if we, if we think of any more, we can we can throw them in. But we should we should move well, on. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I I do recommend if you're if you're interested, you know, uh, to go back. Shop Factory TV has Johnny Carson episodes. Oh yeah, baby. And yeah. you can and I don't know how many are there, but I'm sure on YouTube there's some amazing Randy <laughs> uh, and epic like. He was on fairly regularly and, and you know, he did the whole thing. Like, I offered this amount if you can prove, you know, that was one of his things. Yeah, that's if you can prove like, something, like, like yeah. that was an actual thing. Oh, so God. if you're, if you're really interested in that, that kind of Easter egginess, like you can deep dive that. And it's, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, you know, that was something I grew up, like yeah. when, whenever I was in with summer, especially <laughs> if your parents let you or grandparents in my case, let you stay up, like you just, Carson is the thing. Like I could, I don't have to go to bed. I can watch Johnny Carson, and so, uh, you know, I remembered a lot of that. So I thought that was a really like centering around that, like having a character that's that character was pretty cool. But you can go dig that up, and it's a nice deep dive if you want to. That's a that's a wonderful idea. And and if you what if you haven't watched a lot of these or haven't watched them in a while, then watching this movie and then seeing an old Carson suddenly a lot of like. The way the camera pans across the audience and the the grain and the clothes and everything it's just <laughs> it's just so great it looks it looks really wonderful i am not sure by the way if the aspect ratio is actually correct for television i, I didn't um i didn't pay close enough attention to see to to see if it was so i 
I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, I wanted to talk about this, the hypnosis sequence because the movie's broken up into these sort of large sequences. And um, the first time that it really starts to go bizarre is in um, the, well, no, actually, there's the demon hypnosis sequence, which we've mentioned a little bit. But then there's the one where the guy who, the debunker, says, well, look, I can do this. I'm pretty good at, at hypnosis. So let me do a demonstration. And he brings the sidekick out to, uh, not the psychic, but the sidekick out to, to sit. That's Gus. Takes Gus out and says, okay, I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to hypnotize you. And they do a lot of really crazy stuff involving worms. And I got to say, I was, I was just amazed by this. It was, it was just really gross. It was, it was wonderful. It was done practically so that some of these worm effects were, you know, like something out of the eighties. Um, so, uh, uh, I don't know. Is there anything else that, that we want to yeah, mention? A little, there was a lot of like practical little kind of almost from beyond kind of action too, <laughs> with the coming out of the head. Oh my uh, God. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, there was a moment. Yeah. That was, that was neat when they had the puppet, the puppet worm that like bursts out of, out of Gus. I mean, it was pretty, pretty awesome and disgusting effect. Like, yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they, when they lean into horror, they do it really like it's, it's nice. And, and they, they chose the set pieces really well. Right. Mm -hmm. Like each bill, and then kind of release is its own like we're building towards this oh good lord that's happening you know and then they uh, take a commercial I they were break. smart about it yeah yeah exactly <laughs> which you know also what's cool is the you know when they're in when they're not when they're taking commercial breaks all the footage is in black and white yes which is yes also a fascinating choice and it works really well to frame like you're in a different you're in the it but it's funny that the black and white is the reality yeah so they kind of flip it uh you know because enough I, like, you, you know it's watching our, this at some point in 77 a bunch of people were watching it in black and white that was but, right because they had a black and white television set exactly yes but yeah so, so the idea it. is the archival documentary footage somebody's filming backstage with a black and white video camera for whatever reason you know and and you know, I don't have any. I don't have any reason in universe. You could probably come up with something, but you know, maybe somebody who was involved with TV production could explain to me why that would be. But regardless, you get it as a as a quick shorthand. It's like okay, when we're looking at black and white, we're looking at archival footage backstage, and when we're looking at color, it's what was actually broadcast out live. Uh, right, to, and it does well. Know. It also the. I mean, just for film's sake it separates you into you're in a different you're in a different realm you're in a different world um you're we're not yes. on stage we're not you're like, listening this, to the this people is the reality real. of the situation so yes. all the background behind the scenes stuff uh, yeah. and it's kind of chaotic it's all the stuff you expect if you've ever been on a production yes you know people are running around and there's converse, like multiple conversations up happening. Makeup and, and, and yeah Yes, but but I I thought it was interesting that that they decided like that's going to be the flip, and they do like a kind of almost overlit uh, high contrast black and white. That's it's weird because it's gray. A lot of it's gray. It's not like like crisp, you know, older black and white. It's it's got a, a it's got a more modern. It's actually got a more modern to black and white look. Yeah in some ways uh but i thought that that choice is really fascinating and interesting because it does give us like you're in this area now okay now back to the show and you're back into the isn't that great the oh i love it more saturated but still because it's 70s muted mm -hmm. area well yeah because they're living in a world for some reason of earth tones like everything is orange and brown <laughs> I, 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 those I mean, that was the world of, yeah, that was yes. the same. You look at how much avocado and brown that came. In fact, that's one of the other things that, like, and how much avocado and brown was still around and up until probably even the mid 80s when you had to replace your avocado or brown or orange, uh, oh, yeah. you know, fridge, stove, trap, uh, pots and pans, uh, <laughs> Right, everything that held because things lasted longer. Yes. So the amount of avocado brown and orange uh, definitely set the tone for the what the middle American household was. I I, I was I, I yeah I remember it really well. I was thinking about um, Escape from the Planet of the Apes when Zira gets a oh, suit. Yeah. You know, because because Zira and, and Cornelius are wandering around New York for a while. It's a weird movie and. <laughs> <laughs> and they, and Zira gets a three-piece suit, 
And it's like, if I recall, it was like yellow and brown. So it was like she had, you know, this this ape scientist had come back to the 1970s and fully embraced the color scheme of, of the era. It was, it was pretty great. Um, yeah. Uh, how, and how gauche would it be, though, for a, like, if you're like, oh, he's an orangutan and he's wearing an orange suit. Like, doesn't he know? <laughs> like, oh, how, how gauche that is. Like, there, there were different ape, like, fashion statements. That'd be amazing. That's, that's just, so, yeah. <laughs> that What a great movie, by the way. That's, I'm sorry. We're wasting time. We're talking about Escape from the Planet of the Apes now. So, we should come back <laughs> to Late Night with the Devil. Uh, so, yes, that... Basically, the, the, the three segments, the three main segments are the demonic um, bit and then the hypnosis bit where where Haig, who uh, Drew said correctly, is an asshole, but a very charming asshole. He's, he's got the best lines. He's got great lines. Um, he does his thing where he demonstrates that he, he apparently has the power to hypnotize an entire audience. And so well, they, they to... set this up earlier because they say he is the first person to ever successfully do a mass hypnosis ah, yes. over right. television. Right. So he's able to get everybody to see, and, and his technique is to, you know, the things that we see happen with special effects, when they play it back, it's that he says it, he, he suggests it to you. He goes, oh, you're feeling this, you're seeing that. Cool. Very, very cool. That was, that. I felt like, I, you know, I felt like I was learning things watching that. And that was, that was really neat. So then uh, the next sequence is where they discuss, it's really pretty cool how this movie is set up like that. Because the next they discuss, hey, what just happened? And they go, let's look at. at well, what- also the, the psychic who, who vomited all over the stage <laughs> earlier yeah. has died on his way to the hospital. Yes. After yes. channel after after picking up on um on the host's dead wife yeah. her ghost being around. Haunting them. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we kind of see her for the first time as a ghost because now in this new sequence they are basically playing back video. So they play back video of the well, there's there's, there's also ghost. some subliminal stuff because you occasionally see a hand on Jack's shoulder. Well, and apparently yeah. she's in like reflect various. I didn't notice this, but I, I was did like, the not notice this at all. She's but, in like yeah. reflections and like mirrors <clears throat> and, and stuff. So I think that's pretty cool that they just kind of stick her everywhere. That's that's reminiscent, by the way, of Captain Howdy in um, The Exorcist. Because... Sure, that's the, that's the inspiration for Mr. Wiggles. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, so they finally play back The Exorcism. And they find that unlike Haig's demonstration, where it was clear that it was all suggestion, the exorcism really happened. Or I, I say exorcism, the, the interview with the demon that, that Dr. June did, where, you know, so apparently she really summoned the demon. And at that point, what I cannot remember is how the disagreement over the fact that, therefore, Haig says, okay, so the host must have faked it. How does it suddenly flip into the demon throwing just a huge hissy fit? Like, did, because he goes, he, he goes, um, uh, oh, well... Lily says, "No, let's show, let's back it up and look at the film of of, of my part too." Yeah. Because um, then uh, you know we'll see. And so then, sure enough, it's real. And he's like, "Holy crap!" And then she starts to um, starts to get electrified. Like she just starts crackling. And he goes, yes. "Okay, okay, you don't have to keep up doing it. We, like we get it, whatever." Uh, but that's like then that's we, when, basically yeah. that's just where it goes. All hell down. literally breaks loose. Yes. <laughs> well, I think it's that the the demon is done. Yeah, playing. Done going around. Yeah. Right. Well, like the, there's there's like a, a sort of cat and mouse thing going on all night that that Lily seems in on some sort of mm-hmm. joke that no one else seems privy you know like she yeah. when, when um the sidekick the sort of ed mcmahon stand in gus yeah. is like hypnotized she's like why is gus acting so silly so clearly yeah. you know she's seeing something that she's seeing him just acting goofy because he's hypnotized um and then like Earlier on, like, you know, she's like, oh, we've met before, you know, during the, the tall trees, you yeah. know. Well, and you she, know, no, we... she, she t- fully takes on um, 
the wife's voice at that point. Yeah, that point. that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah, oh, yeah. She, she takes yeah. on. Like, do, on... I, do I look pretty? Or like, and she says, yeah. like, in a deep voice, yeah. So Haig's, yeah. Haig's only explanation, he says, okay, the only way all of this makes sense then is if Jack has arranged all of this. That because he's still living in the rational world, and he goes, Okay, so the only rational explanation is we just go back a layer, and Jack is the one who's controlling it. But when the right. demon makes herself visible, yeah. uh, Haig hilariously immediately like goes, Good enough for me, and he drops to his knees and begins chanting his <laughs> hell. Well, well, first, he's like the power of Christ, Christ no, it's Christ. Gus that does the power that, that of Christ compels you, and he gets his head twisted around. Oh, right, yes. right, right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Um, like, yes, so Car Abe yeah, Carmichael goes, gets on his knees, you know, you're right. I, I, for one, welcome the role of our new demon, yeah, I like, yeah. welcome our, our aunt or lords, whatever it was. Um, yeah. yes. No, and then uh, he pulls out the check because the whole thing was that he would give uh, a bunch of money to anybody. A half a, a, half a million he dollars. The, he pulls yeah. out the check and the check bursts into flames and then he melts from within. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. And that poor was poor Dr. June gets strangled slash throat. garroted. Yeah. 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 It's 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 funny how, like, I feel like it's not funny. It's actually very effective. But the this movie does a lot of small things to disarm you. Like they have like the the you know people in the audience that are in Halloween costumes, so they're acting like a little bit like just off. Mm. And you know you, you you but then you'll have like these short bursts of horror, like like the the psychic vomiting and then the worms coming out of Gus. But when this movie really, like, this sequence of the demon basically killing everybody in the studio, like, it's, mm. like, like, it's, it's horrific. And I just really sort of wish that the movie had ended here. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, does the demon kill everybody in the studio or some people get away? I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure some people, sure some get, people get away. But all of the characters that we've been following. Everybody on, yeah. the, on the stage. Yeah. Gets it. With the yes. exception yeah. of David Asmalkian. Yes. Yeah, he he gets the the producer pulls him backstage. But also, and... he just he just gets spared because by that point he could have been killed ten times over. So he gets spared because the deal is with him. He has the deal. Well, so... and I also think that the demon wanted this. It's 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 completing his corruption. You know, well, the like, problem is now the movie at the point where everybody else is dead. Davis, David Desmalkian gets pulled into a, a vision, and the movie does a 2001. Like it just suddenly is like. Well, it, that's what. But before we get to that, because that's the part Drew was talking about. That he yeah, like. yeah. Um, I want to say though that this, the whole point is because she says, Lily says to him, "Oh, you're going to be very famous after tonight." And uh, so the idea is that this is the deal he made with the devil is you're going to get to have all the fame that you want because he hasn't had it up until this point. Yeah. But the sacrifices, you know, you make sacrifices. This... So so he has to survive because that's the whole point. Hmm. And yeah. this is always the thing that that drove me nuts as a kid. Like I as I reached adulthood, I understood more. But as a kid, when you have <laughs> People like they like the devil is also called like the you know the prince of lies etc. And you want to go like he's it's in the name. Why yes. are you making this deal? <laughs> I don't think, but I don't think that there was ever like him you know meeting a devil at the cross. No, no, I get that. What like I'm talking that. about is in general. Yeah, like you're if you're lots of people in you know supposedly in real life but definitely in literature go well this can't i'm gonna be the one everybody else is wrong like they just didn't know the devil like i knew the devil yeah right? i can outlaw you the devil i can and... totally like this i'm i'm gonna be fine yes. and he's told me all the things i like like how could i not trust this it's this, hilarious the devil is basically it. always lucy pulling away the football he's always like right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Don't worry about it. Every time I saw, especially like I said, like as an adult, you kind of get the nuance of why, how people, how this works, and how psychology works, etc. But like you, as a kid, though, especially you go, why are you so stupid? And maybe, maybe we all should retain a little bit of that and go, yeah, no, that's still a, a terrible idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, but, within the context of this movie, though, I think there isn't just that he's sort of like sold his soul in the the Faustian sense 
I think that, you know, th this demon is enjoying, there's a corruption going on here. Like, right. He really, he really did love his wife. Like that. No, was but I, I think there is a cure. I think, no, but... I think, that, I think there fully is a deal with the devil because the whole thing with the trees and the cult that he's in, they do all yeah, these but sacrifices. I think, he, I think he, I think he, I don't think he believed, I think he may have done some rituals, but I don't think he actually believed it. Like, oh, I don't I, think so. I think he did. I, 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 I don't did. think, I don't, I, I don't think so. It's because, obviously open to interpretation. But well, no, yeah, it's, it's so. ambiguous, but I do think that like you see this guy's downfall that mm -hmm. like he basically chooses his wife's soul suffering and then and then you also add on you know he he stabs this little girl there's this this corruption going on that they've taken this guy and they've taken his hubris and they've used it to completely twist him well that's and, what evil does i mean that's yeah, the whole but point that's, though, that's, right like that's more interesting to me than you know i signed a piece of paper in my blood you no, know no 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 that, but that's that but that's again the the more nuanced version of that is exactly like and and it's what it's what this demon and this cult is counting on like he's like ah you know whatever the it's a means to an end whatever and what it shows him is actually no this is really bad for everybody it affects everybody around you kills them and this corruption is is all part of this and it's although, his fault you know what i mean although in fairness to to julia's end of things because it is a valid interpretation like jack is in this cult right and yeah. he's like hanging out and let's just assume you know the people in this cult when they take their their owl masks off and you know strip for the orgy you know he's looking at like rock stars and presidents and you know captains of industry and things like this and he's probably going well these people they're all doing okay they signed right. they sold their soul you know so yeah. you know maybe maybe i can trust this abraxas guy mm -hmm. you know like like i mean that is a valid interpretation of, of well, it's the whole I'll, 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 i would and this is going to be a super old thing. Apologies to everybody under 50 in the audience, but um, I will I will gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. It's the whole idea that you're going to be, um, you know, that you're willing to pay the price later for whatever glory you're going to get right now. So mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, someday I'll have to pay. Um, but, you know, right now I get what I want. Which I, I don't, don't think, think he, he outright that. knew that they were going to take his wife, though. I really no, but don't. they know there. He knows there's a sacrifice. He they didn't even he have did. the line uh, when when he's signing the contract with what the did network. You have to sacrifice. Um, what did but, you sacrifice? Yeah. Except for that, like guy in Rosemary's Baby, like clearly understands the deal he made, and this sure. guy doesn't come across like guy in Rosemary's Baby at all. Well, I think well, because no, 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 of no. the nature of this, you're allowed to fill in a lot yeah. of blanks. Like it's done in such a way that you're have. Like the conversation that we're having is the conversation that an audience member is supposed to be happening because this Fair. is a movie that wants you to interact. That's with a really it. good point. That's a, that, that is. Uh, so, Drew, why don't you, because you were, you weren't really all that happy with it, but I would love for it to hear you sort of, you don't have to describe it beat by beat, but what happens next after everybody's dead and david s malkian gets pulled backstage so he is pulled off stage and suddenly we the movie devolves into surrealism mm -hmm. which i think i would be fine with in another movie like because this is generally done as like a found footage style movie this did not work for me like i i felt like it was a step too far like the hypnosis was one thing but but like this i don't know like it just i i i didn't engage with it well like i and you know i've i've tried to wrap my head around it but you know it, it it just doesn't match the rest of the movie very well to, for me like it doesn't ruin the movie obviously because you know i i've just praised a bunch of stuff about it but yeah you know i just i just think that that you know i either wish that they had ended with like the studio catching fire or something like you know something a little bit more on camera i guess um like something that could have been part of the talk show format that we've been following absolutely i mean 
you know, in theory, you could have had, in, instead of the surrealist recreation of the meetings of the Grove on a TV stage, which is what happens, uh, plus other stuff, you could have had something more like, you know, people sifting through the ruins the next day and finding something cool or, or, or you know, any number of ways of like, of like sayonaring out of the movie. You could have even gone back to like the documentary style where you have a narrator sort of yeah. describe what happens because we don't really know what ha- Jack is right. the only yeah, it character would be interesting. for the surprise. Yeah, it would be I kind of want to have the to have the narrator go, and that's why he's in the mental institution or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, did, he, did he go on trial? Did he? Did he? Yeah, that's why he's serving the rest of his life in prison. (laughs) I mean, this temper tantrum looks like Carrie's tantrum, right? And Carrie, what they do is they next cut to, you know, Amy Irving at the grave scene. And then they have a little little stinger that's cool. But, but, you know, they could have done something like that. Yeah, there's a million things they did. They could have done. Now, the implication with with the 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 i can't remember the exact line he's he's <clears throat> mumbling dreamer but, you're awake yeah like he he thinks he's hypnotized yeah you know he he's he thinks he's hypnotized and he's gonna snap out of it yeah and you know that's that's kind of cool but like everything leading up to it i i don't know it just didn't work for me I and understand. you yeah. know i i you know i think <sighs> How did I mean? How did everybody else feel about the fact that you have this scene with his wife, and then you know his wife asks basically? No, asks I didn't like it. It was so the mercy on the nose. killing, and it was yeah, so like so on the nose. I was like, oh come on, like we're not. I, I told Jason, I'm like, wow, this this part really thinks this audience is, is stupid that she has to like explain it all and spell it out. Well, and then like the whole bit of like he stabs her, but he's actually stabbed Lily, you know, with yeah. the sacrificial dagger. Like it mm-hmm. just, I don't know. Like it, it. No, I didn't love that part either. It's, I, it's yeah. I found it interesting. Like, I mean, it's hard. It's hard because you're you want to go, hey, do your art, right? Like, who am I to tell the filmmaker how to make their film? So I think it's interesting that they went there, but I also would have been fine with just uh like the, the ending being the the end of like where everything just goes horribly awry and yes. we get that final i would have been fine with that being the final shot of the demon the true form of the demon oh yeah absolutely like, that would have yeah. been absolutely fine so i don't want to say like oh no i you know don't don't do your art the way you do it but it, it well no of course to no, me it had more I... impact like as as that being like oh whoa we have just ended the the broadcast has ended right yeah. what i do and... like about it is that you don't know that you have no idea what actually has happened like you don't know if f- to what extent what is the tv audience seeing have they did they did the power for the tv audience go out the second she started crackling or have they been watching all this and what are they seeing like I'm, at that part i'm really interested i would love to know like what is it that the actual tv audience at home has seen yeah. up until this point and by the way the makers of this movie might be listening to this show <laughs> so well, yeah no but, but then we're allowed to say that something doesn't no, work no no i'm not complaining i'm just saying <laughs> saying you know it, it's it's so funny because you know real human beings sat down and tried to make these decisions and go like what do i do now do i have a amy irving thing in the graveyard and then you know or or you know do i do the documentary or do i do this like and yeah go ahead drew and and clearly you know this movie works for a lot of people because it's been a fairly big hit so yeah, it mostly like, works for us we just didn't really yeah it. it's just it's just this one ass like it wouldn't yeah. stop me from watching it again exactly. and here's the thing like i might feel different about the ending depending you know there's been several times in my life where i go back and i revisit a movie and i end up liking something a lot more yeah you know a second go around so well, like it is entirely possible that'll happen with this yeah and that's that's again what i'm talking about is i you know i think it's valid to to say like hey this worked better for me or it didn't um but i also it's easy to also follow like oh i don't know why they oh would they what were they even thinking like it's not like that at all right it's right well I, and that's not what i was fascinating as a but, as a piece yeah. of art that that's that we do get this it's all it's kind of an epilogue or a series of epilogues in a, in a way 
because we're it's it, i think you're right in the fact that it's a very uh it's a very 2001 kind of vibe yeah and and look that's really cool too and that again works for some people it does it right <laughs> like right. you can so i don't i know think we're it's, not i don't think it's bad as Kubrick. arc at all you know i never uh, i i was never crazy i'm not worried about offending kubrick i never liked the ending of 2001 i mean i i, I mean that's... I, I always felt like like they got tired of like he got tired of the narrative it was like i don't know <laughs> and i don't feel like that's here because we do get this this twisted you know we do get the final final part where he realizes like oh the demon has led me to yes stab you well know, it's I like guess. he's not he's like he's not accepting you know like right. he knows what's happened but he's like oh, you know, he's yeah yeah he, he he's like I, I you know i i must be hypnotized because this is so horrible it can't be real yeah. right and you know you can't honestly blame him after you know you know seeing what hypnosis can do but like it's um yeah yeah I don't no know. absolutely I, I i i am going to revisit this movie and it is entirely possible that the ending will work better for me on another viewing like this is i gotta say it's beautiful though i loved seeing the grove presented as something like on a bbc set like a stage you know they're they're like that was neat like that was really surreal and and cool to to see you know the trees on on a stage like that um, well and i like all the you know the business of like the procession of the people in their halloween costumes like visually i do like that yeah. i just i almost would like it better as a standalone image than part right. of this narrative but you know by the way those sketches the oh go ahead please endings are tough though like yeah. as, as somebody who is a is a is a, a writer you know like endings are for me the hardest part <laughs> of anything to write i i'm with you i mean J jason and i uh specifically me because he was like hey man this is your time to shine i think it was book two of psychom mm -hmm. i we rewrote the ending to that i what four five times yes because uh, and your our, time and to we, shine also means i'm not rewriting this again so good luck right no exactly exactly <laughs> but part of it was because i was a lot doing a lot of the action scenes too but you know and we we both had fooled ourselves into going it's good enough which is never what you should do if you say yes. i think it's good enough it's probably not like right. that's you convincing yourself luckily yeah. we had an editor who didn't want to rewrite it but he did give us he's like look I, you guys can do better than this like this is okay we we could i we could put this out and it would be fine but do yeah. you want fine or do you want like really good and it's yeah. up to it's up to the reader to to find if it was if what we did turn in was really good <laughs> like i'm not you know i'm not saying oh man we just killed it then but like endings are really hard yeah, and yeah. you know especially when you're when you're deep in the art like you know i i'm certainly not the one to tell uh you know the filmmaker they were like they were wrong um but I, you know but there are but again we're talking about it. and so part of that kind of switcheroo and how how it's done and how we go back into his mind it's actually like interesting mm -hmm. um but i and and it does subvert expectations i mean i think everybody does expect it just to end in a cut like the yes thing is yeah, done. That's true. Just so think. Yeah. like <clears throat> continuing is like whoa i didn't where are we wait where are we going now mm. so you know that's pretty fascinating yeah well well, well said uh all right i i think that we've pretty much covered everything we should get our our final thoughts and i would like to i mean like actually before we do that there are a couple of other films these are not our our endorsements but there are other things that you should watch if you like this and one before the one that you guys wanted to mention which i think is the most important one but i gotta say you gotta check out the wnuf halloween special because it is a fake 1970s visa a vhs Halloween special for a TV station, and it's great. Actually, I think it's like early '80s, but whatever. And well, and that... the opening black and white sequence is is based on the Killing of America in a 1981 shockumentary documentary, oh. The Killing of America. So that'd be that'd be interesting to check out as well. Okay, and the WNUF Halloween special is a fake Halloween special, but uh, uh, Tony, you were talking about Ghost Watch 
or Drew or both of you? Both yeah, of both, us. I think both of us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, like if you you this this movie drinks pretty deeply of the Ghost Watch well, and I don't mean that as an insult. Like I I think, no no yeah Ghost Watch is excellent, and I think this movie sort of up updates that style of found footage movie extremely well. Um, Ghost Watch, for those who do not know, uh, is a ni- early 1990s British TV movie that was framed as a Halloween special in which real British journalists, and I mean like actual British journalists, and d- pretended to investigate a haunted house and terrible things ensue. So... This it, it would be the equivalent of like somebody on the morning show, like Phil or or something like 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 Good Morning America, like slipping a horror movie into an episode of Good Morning uh-huh. America, and um, you know, so like you do lose a little bit if of that if you are not from England because you're not you don't have the relationship with the TV personalities but it still works really well and the good news is is if you're watching you you have Shudder to watch Late Night with the Devil you can also watch Ghost Watch because it's also on Shudder yeah I was I was happy because for years and years you could hear if you were in the know you'd hear about it but it was really hard to find and so i saw some clips and some stills and then i was like oh crap i wonder if that's still the case and lo and behold ghost watches on shutter um i was saying also by the way if you're looking for found footage i when i watched ghost watch this time i went oh man paranormal activity uh really owes it owes a huge debt to ghost watch or if not, there was something in the air because mm. that there are a lot of things in Ghost Watch that I went, oh, even the the uh, set pieces. I think influence like the the parts where they're on soundstage, you know, yes. like talk show stuff in <laughs> Ghost Watch. I think this this is closer to that, uh, you know, this film. But but boy, the setups and how they they do misdirection and stuff in a uh, Paranormal Activity. If they hadn't seen Ghost Watch, I would be surprised. Mm-hmm. The only thing that makes me, I mean, if you're, you're a movie buff, you have your, cause I had a copy a VHS copy of ghost watch in the early aughts because I bought one off of eBay. So like, you know, you, there are ways of getting things if you, you, you want them, but um, the only thing that makes me question if they did, because you are right, is that you know it was very hard to get a hold of a legitimate copy. No, I, I I thought so. I I mean I'm I again I'm not saying oh they end up ripping this off. I just said that you know my my thoughts are if they didn't see it, boy, like that. It, I guess I'm, I'm I'm more saying if you enjoyed those movies, like you'll see that like oh here's here's this other version yeah. of that from like 92 even whoa how like how do we how do we get from there to to say paranormal activity right well and i do Um, think ghost watch is important in the 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 development of what we think of as found footage horror movies the only difference now is i did recognize a couple of people from you know bbc stuff yeah. So, you know, you kind of get not being there in 92, like, you know, not like in the same way that, you know, we've heard, we know Orson Welles, the person, not Orson Welles, the guy who was reading, uh, you know, War of the Worlds, right? So like, how, yes. how are people fooled by this? Like, well, because everything was of that moment. That's how that happened, right? So you could see how, and, and you know, there's been a lot of discussion recently as well about uh, Blair Witch and people disbelieving that it actually worked. And you go, well, if you were there at that That's time right. Right. with yeah. early internet, with the buzz, with just the way media worked, it, even people who were like, no, nah, it's fake though, right? kind of also you kind of sort of went but is it really fake yeah even a little like even if you're totally convinced it's it's, no way it's real that's fine like the the mythology of it had you just just believe just on the cusp of like well huh i think that's actually there's also a, a goofy you know even with blair witch there was a goofy sort of enjoyment in 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 believing that it might have been real. Exactly. Though, like you know, yeah, I'm with you totally. 
like even if you knew you you it was interesting to entertain well you know there's all these websites popping up and, and early internet webs like like you know that that was the the kind of magic of the moment yeah right and the same like again going back to war of the worlds why would the radio people lie to us about aliens yeah <laughs> like i mean there was there was a certain gravity to that that even if i'm sure there were a bunch of people who were like this is clap <clears throat> trap right but it only had to You only had to get enough people going. I listen to the news from the radio. I listen for emergencies. How could this not be real? Because that was your touchstone at the time. So, you know, as we, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting how that flows into our modern era. And now you just have to watch out for every, like you just, we all have to be the, uh, you know, the Carmichael Hags or the amazing Randys. (laughs) Yeah. Because, or else are the, are the, are the, you know, scullies um because the the switch over to me was when i became aware and i was aware later than most people that that a lot of what we were seeing on tv that even you thought was going to be real was fake like the the backgrounds when they're on a bus stop on you know orange county or or you know on on uh, betty betty lefea they're they're you know they're they're at the bus stop and and everything behind them is a green screen but it doesn't look like it because they've gotten so good at these special effects that you know the stuff that doesn't even look like a special effect is a special effect right um, oh by the way i want to mention I, I don't want to you know sorry if i keep harping on this but i i did remember something along the way if hmm. you want to kind of see a little bit of the real life prototype for the Carmichael Haig, Chris Du, mm. back and forth. Uh, Amazing Randy had a, there was a, there was a kind of beef between him and uh, Yuri Geller, <laughs> who was, you know, the psychic of the time. Yes. And that, that real life kind of on Carson, on, you know, on talk shows uh, and bled into real life. All stuff the good shit is, happened is on Carson. Little, I mean, it's the I'm... little bits that are that, like that feeds into this. And I think that, that, the fact that there are so many, you know, nostalgia touchstones, probably everybody else is like, okay, oldie. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, you know, mining that I think is fascinating. So they did, a, I think they did a really good job. But I, I was just remembering that there was that whole, like, I could be in spoons. Well, so can I, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I was just thinking how everything like that used to happen on Carson, you know, because car oh, like Chevy Chase getting into a not a fist fight, but a fight with uh, with uh, Siskel and Ebert that happened on Carson. I mean, although Hogan knocking out Richard Belzer happened on Belzer's show, so that I'll never forget that. That was just the craziest shit. But okay, uh, let's do endorsements, Julia. Uh, I mean, you and I watch things together all the time. <clears throat> But yes, but I I, I, remember I told you what I, what I wanted to endorse, which is um, we watched the Netflix series Ripley, which oh, is yeah. the talented Mr. Ripley um, in a miniseries. And oh, I thought it was just stunning. I mean, I could not get over how gorgeous this, ser- this miniseries was. It was like so crisp it's black and white and it's this crisp the text it was like i think jason who who are you quoting when you said that they said it was like an ansel adams i think that was uh it was the the culture writer on slate yeah um, that, um uh, because i i totally i agree with that 100 percent. it's like an ansel adams picture come to life in the series it is just gore. i mean it's a, it's it's an interesting story it's great performance all that it's you know it definitely does a great job of of stretching out the talented mr ripley's story into you know a bunch of episodes and like telling that story that that was all wonderful but what i just couldn't get past was how it looked i mean i was just as an as amateur photographer i just was like fascinated by the text and the the contrast and the color. so i highly recommend that if for no other reason than just to look at it but also because it's really uh well acted well written um interesting Wonderful. so yeah thank you uh tony what do you got for us i've got a few things uh i think i talked about it before but just in case i noticed uh rain and i were going through trying to find movies and um i think it'd be fun to at least cover i don't know if we if it fits this the cover uh riddle of fire which is the closest everything about it like when we're talking like this looks 
this movie, uh, Late Night with the Devil, looks seventies in this way. Riddle of Fire, they really went out of their way to make everything look like an after school special. Cool. And uh, I think I, I hope I have. I'm not re-endorsing it, but I noticed it was up on Amazon. I noticed it's on several uh, platforms, and so uh, and I talked about it about Fant- at Fantastic Fest. But if you want to see what a modern reimagining of an after school special is. Riddle of Fire has you covered. Um, I also saw point. Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, which I, you know, was really glad to see, you know, just Nazis getting ripped up in a tight, you know, uh-huh. it's Guy the guy Ritchie doing Guy Ritchie stuff. Yeah. Uh, you may or may not be into that, but uh, I was, and I thought it was, it felt like for anybody, I don't know how many gamers listen to uh, this, but there's a game called Commandos uh, that was a stealth kind of, you, you had a squad, and you got the squad together and you would try to, you know, kill Nazis and, and hide them and make sure they didn't, you know, do these missions. It felt like a live action version of that. Mm. Um, but also in conjunction with that on Netflix, there's a show, a reality show called Churchill's Secret Agents, The New Recruits. Mm. And they basically go through the kind of the real life version of where uh, Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, like kind of where it came from. But in a reality setting where they're training people to be these agents, but w- I mean, way more realistically, right? Training them to be spies. And they go through, you know, what what the life of a spy, like your your life was probably cut short. Uh <laughs> If you decide to become one of these spies and it's that that show is really good. And finally, uh, on the horror side, I cannot say enough good things about Abigail Man, that mm. movie rocks. Ah, oh. <laughs> go. It's vampire movie. I mean, I, I do uh, a friend of mine, Alan Cerny, who's a critic. Uh, he said something I thought was true. I wish that they had left the mystery in the movie. Hmm. Um, I, I think they give away the trailers and the poster probably give away a little, like it would have been more interesting to like, I, he was right in my opinion about, Hey, it would have been nice if there was a mystery around where things go. Now there's still a lot that of course isn't there. So it's still worth it. But uh, I, I I agree that I wish there was less in the trailers, but boy, that it's really good. <laughs> I thoroughly, that's one of my, definitely one of my favorites of the horror and the horror genre this year. Uh, Drew, have you seen it yet? No. Ah, oh, dude. It, oh, it's so good. Like I, I know a little bit about the production though. And as much as everybody is saying that the trailers kind of spoiled it um originally it was going to be called dracula's daughter so uh, <laughs> well, really? yeah i mean you know, yeah yeah it's 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 a apparently started life as a very 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 loose remake of dracula's daughter so no kidding yeah. Huh. Yeah. but oh man when it they do a lot of good stuff the cast i look is great. forward, like, I look I, forward to good. watching it i i i have heard nothing but good things about um, it and i i like um radio silences stuff usually so yeah this is um, this is definitely a one i i look forward to talking about i wish we had you know it'd be that it would be a good one to cover if we you know everybody's schedules is everybody's schedule so i get it but uh if if we don't get to cover it soon then when it comes out on demand yeah. we gotta do it because it is super solid i mean i love melissa barrera so it's it's it'll be uh, you know yeah. anything with her is, is always cool so it's great anyway yeah that's my that's that's my oh and well one final thing uh i think we you posted it but uh if anybody who can tell what the algorithm's gonna do uh mm-hmm. but our first single for our new album deserts of mars new album uh dead planet exodus mm-hmm. came out it's a song called crimson mountain uh strangely enough it's the album is kind of a loose concept album so that's the song that we released is kind of the end of the concept album. <laughs> it's not the end, but it's closer to it and, and story-wise. Uh, but we wanted to, you know, we have a new guitarist. We, we're really trying to pick it up. So uh, I did a lyric video for it. That's on YouTube. Uh, in the same way that the reason I'm kind of plugging it is in the same way that Gamerscore or Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic all are the ways that people judge whether something is good uh, as far as like getting eyes on it, getting a, in this case, getting a label to look at you yeah. is Spotify. So we did release it to every platform. You can listen to it on all platforms. Any platform helps, right? If you if you're interested in a new deserts of mars song which i hope you but are spotify helps more um, than others is it, the- <laughs> it spotify it doesn't help me financially for sure well i mean i say that but boo boo hoo you know whatever 
but yeah. as far as eyes on, but of course the you know, watching the YouTube video that I put the lyric video I put together also is nice because I was able to take um my friend Sana's amazing album cover that she did. But luckily she turned it over and I, I was like, man, you know, I don't want to just do a album cover YouTube video. <laughs> so I was able to dust off my animation chops and make that video. So uh, if you look up Desert to Mars, Crimson Mountain, you can find it. We're on Spotify. We're on Bandcamp. Uh, some really amazing people have actually bought the single. Cool. Which there eventually there will be a full album. And so anybody who did that, I'm just like, you are amazing. But uh, all of that helps because we're... We don't have a release date yet for the album because I'm still kind of shopping around to labels mm -hmm. um, in the background. And if not, I'll self-release and that that's OK because we can we have Bandcamp now. But uh, but yeah, so if you're if you're interested in a song about trying to attack a rocket fortress and escape a dead planet and you want a high energy rock and roll song, Mars Metal, as we call it, Crimson Mountain has you covered. So. Fantastic. Thanks for thanks for listening to my pitch. <laughs> no, that was great. And I, I've, I've I've really really loved it. Uh, awesome, Drew. Uh, what do you have for us? Um, so I I was really busy this week, so I I didn't get into my normal amount of stuff, but I I was able to watch um uh, Dead Boy Detectives uh on netflix which is both a spin-off of the doom patrol show and the sandman show so um it's got that going for it um and i think if you like both of those shows you will find a lot to like here it's got the the strong uh neil gaiman vibes it's it does change some stuff from the comics so like if you're a purist about it um that might bother you i myself i guess because i i understand people who are are who are disappointed about the changes but uh particularly with uh the the title characters being teenagers instead of uh like preteens like in the comics but um because I guess I am not as emotionally attached to these characters. I was just kind of able to take the show sort of as its own thing. And I found it really entertaining and engaging and stylish. So uh, not, not quite horror, you know, it's, it's whatever, whatever genre you would call Sandman, but it, you know, there's definitely horror elements. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll, you'll get something out of it, I think. That's wonderful. Um, thank you very much. I, <laughs> what I'm going to endorse this time is only, let me see, it is only 12 minutes long, but I'm going to endorse Possibly in Michigan, which is a short horror film or a film horror short, I don't know how best to say it, called Possibly in Michigan, which was made by Cecilia Condit, who's, who's an artist, and it is about these two women being stalked by a stalker in a a department store but it was filmed in 1983 on video and it is very it's surreal it's completely surreal and full of weird tones and music and masks and that sounds like something that sctv would have had a really good time uh making fun of and actually i'm sure that they would have if they had been aware of possibly in michigan but it's still something you can't take your eyes off of for 12 minutes so uh, that's that's my recommendation. The Cecilia Condit's possibly in Michigan. You have to see it to believe it. Uh, that's um, and that's it for me. So, uh, all right, that concludes our discussion of Late Night with the Devil and a bunch of other really cool stuff. So, everybody, be excellent to one another. Come to the Facebook page. Tell us what you think about all this. If you watch Possibly in Michigan, please interpret it for me and explain to me what it's about. Uh, I, because I think I know, but I'm not completely sure. And um, I think it's feminist, but I'm not sure. Uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. I think we're on. A, I think we're on a little break for the next few weeks. So everybody yes, have indeed. a yeah, lovely right. rest of your. We've, we've left you with a bunch of of episodes to <laughs> yes. occupy your time with. Yeah, for real. <laughs> we've yeah. had a good run here. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, and we will talk to you very soon. Bye. Bye. Take care, everybody.